uh, the last uh, two lectures, we covered some important topics about uh, MEG. We, we covered the MEG uh, forward and inverse problem and MEG source imaging. We talk about different and uh, MEG inverse modeling from a dipole fit to and the imaging approach using an L2 minimum norm. And also we spend a lot of effort to uh, talk about this uh, high resolution uh, MEG source imaging using the spatial tempo L1 norm, which is Vesto. And also we talk about the um, and another approach, which is Beamformer. And, and last week, we also covered the topic of the MEG uh, clinical application with a focus on uh, epilepsy and pre-surgical functional mapping in patient with brain tumor. So um, today uh, we're gonna continue our, our lecture on the some of the topics on MEG research. Um, one of the th first thing I want to cover is the uh, research using MEG for um, mild traumatic burn injury or mild TBI. And the, the focus is on these, uh, the resting state. And uh, the first one marker using MEG, um, low frequency delta band activity and doing the resting state recording. Uh, we know this uh, um, detecting the MAR TBI has been quite challenging using the conventional uh, neural imaging method. Uh, even though we know TBI is the leading cause of sustained impairments in our veteran population, military personnel, and also civilian population in general. Uh, but when you use the conventional CT or MRI and the structural imaging for detecting MAR TBI, the sensitivity is quite limited. With about five to 10%, you know, and you can see the pie chart, the positive findings is quite small percentage using the conventional CT MR. The reason is we know there's a uh, axonal injury is the one of the leading cause for MR TBI, but the conventional CT MR, the main is sensitive to blood product in the brain. And they're less sensitive to the axonal damage itself. So it is quite, quite possible and they underestimate the presence of external injury, especially in the MAR-TBI cases. While in the past, you know, and uh, uh, people use MEG and detect there's uh, one type of uh, abnormal signal, which is a low frequency, kind of slow wave, or maybe in the delta frequency band, one to four hertz, sometimes extended to data band and uh, four to seven hertz, doing the resting state recording. The, um, so today, uh, well, I'm sure this is one typical example, you know, of the, the delta wave slowing. And you can see the burst over here. There's not continuous slow wave, you know, which is different from the, say, you know, we have delta wave sleep. I'm going to talk about that one later on. This is like a common burst, come and go, you know, and the, uh, the you know, the uh, it's associated, it's, it's characteristic of neurological injury in the brain. And uh, can be due to the axon injury, physical damage, or some neurochemical blockage, for example, you know, cholinergic pathway limitation. It's not just happening in TBI. Of course, TBI is the one with focus today, but also happened in patient stroke, brain tumor, and epilepsy. However, based on you know um structural imaging, CTMR, you can easily rule out stroke and tumor, right? And based on medical history, you can rule out. Uh, epilepsy and this patient get you know and uh, will suffer from uh, those symptoms after say a car accident. So you can link the slow wave generation to specific TBI events when you rule out the other possibilities. And in the past, people have been using this uh, the, the, the dipole approach. Uh, in this case, and uh, there's uh, let me see, you can minimize this. Uh, by video panel, okay. Um, in the past, people have been using this uh, uh, dipole fit for for the source localization of this uh, abnormal slow wave. And there's a limitation. Sometimes the slow wave is complicated. There's many sources, you know, that all together, you know, for the specific time, you know. So that's quite different from the, say, epilepsy. When they have a interactive spike, sometimes most of the cases in the epilepsy, the spike discharge, uh, at least the peak components 
can be effective model with, with one electric current dipole. We'll, we'll talk about the dipole model in our previous lectures. But the for slow wave, it's more complicated. So and that leads us to and uh, well, you know, before we we make the improvement, let's look at the underlying neurophysiology of slow wave evaluation. That actually had been solved uh, quite a while ago uh, in the 70s by uh, three scientists in the same lab. They are part of the, uh, the Montreal Neurological Institute, uh, MNI. So the, the published the first paper, a couple of papers in, uh, in 19, 1977, and Glor, and Ball, and Shaw. And the first time they do is they generate physical damage in the animal, which is cat. Okay, uh, of course the the recording, and they is more invasive. They open the skull, put electro grid, on the cortex. So when they generate physical damage to the, to the axon, and then the electro overlay the area of the gray matter overlay the injury area, and they show this abnormal dental wave, one to four hertz. So the the, uh, the conclusion for the first couple of studies shows actually potentially there's a defragmentation, and yeah, because it's physical damage to the axonal pathway that lead to the generation of the abnormal delta wave. And the next year, to confirm the hypothesis, in this case, instead of generate physical damage to the axon, they inject atropine. We know atropine is a very aggressive uh, antagonist for acetylcholine. The, cholinergic, the, you know, the, the neurotransmitter. So when they generate the cholinergic blockage, and then the electro and, and the cortex pop up, pretty much the same, you know, abnormal delta wave. So the, the conclusion is either physical damage to the axon or some uh, neurochemical blockage. For example, the, the, the cholinergic uh, transmission blockage can all lead to what's called deafferentation, the lack of afferent input to the specific brain area. That's the reason of this uh, delta wave generation. So um, to study this, this topic, and uh, we uh, actually, um, we studied you know, three groups. And uh, the first group is, well, the recording is uh, pretty straightforward. It's a resonance state recording you know, with eyes closed, you know, two blocks, you know, five, five minutes each. Or well, the first group, we have 36 mild TBA patient. Uh, they were injury due to blast uh, when served in uh, Afghanistan or Iraq. Those are uh, veterans or active duty military personnel. And the second group, we have 48 mild TBI with non-blast injury. Those are civilians with multi-vehicle accidents or injury in fall. And all of them, they are in a chronic phase. The, so on average, we have this uh, uh, MEG measurement six months after the injury. So we're not looking at the acute subjects, you know, because based upon our, uh, our you know, literature search, you know, about 75 to 80% patient with mild TBI or concussion. After three months, the symptom free, they're fully recovered, which is a good thing, right? You know, so I bump my, I bump my head pretty hard, I may have concussion and, uh, but most of the time, you know, within days and weeks, I fully recover. I don't have a long, you know, long-term deficit. That's a good thing, but there's remaining but 25, 30% of the patient with mild TBI. They have, you know, ongoing, you know, and the persistent symptoms, you know, they can last quite a while, in months and years. Those are the people actually need some help because they have difficulties go to school, you know, hold their job, you know, also, you know, have, you know, and uh, you know, have difficulties with their family life. And those are one we're targeting, um, you know, the people with, you know, more TBI patient with ongoing symptoms in the chronic phase. So we have also 79 patient was uh, in the healthy control group. So in in this study, we're looking at for the, the positive, you know, detection rate or, you know, and the positive finding rate in, in the three groups. In, in, so the y-axis is the, you know, the, the maximum z-score uh, with cluster analysis, you know, and the x-axis are three groups, the healthy control, the mild TBI with blast, the mild TBI with non-blast. One striking thing see, you can see the small overlap between the healthy control and two TBI group that like this. If we pick up threshold, the solid line, and you know, none of healthy control are, are go above, above this threshold. 
Now you have 86.1% sensitivity, you know, sensitivity, a positive finding rate for the patient with mild TBI due to blast. And for the mild TBI due to non-blast causes, our sensitivity is also pretty high, but 83.3%. And now, now you combine the blast with non-blast mild TBI, you can, you know, positive finding rate approaching 85%, which is substantially better than the CT or MR for mild TBI, which is only about a few percent. Because our sensitivity is pretty high, so now we can actually go to individual subjects. And here's the one, and when they map out to the MNI standard brain, we look at, you know, and uh, the different cases, patient was, you know, was uh, mild TBI, you can see they are actually not homogeneous, which is the nature of this mild TBI, because the damage can come from left side, right side, and so on. And, but if you have enough those those patients, you put them together, you start to see the picture because you see a lot of frontal lobe, act, you know, and the abnormal delta wave. And because we have 85% sensitivity, we can detect those one in the individual patient. And that's the beauty of this approach. Well, if you have a, a lot of those patients together, you can look at the, you know, what part of the brain is more vulnerable to TBI. You can see a lot of frontal area and that show actually high likelihood of being injured. You know, the also some of the uh, inferior temporal region and so on. We also did some uh, correlation analysis, look at the abnormal MEG slow wave generation with different uh, symptoms. We see this positive correlation, the frontal delta wave correlate positively with personality change and you know, frontal region with trouble concentration with uh, effective lability and the fusiform area with a visual problem and the uh, anterior cingulate area with depression. So you can see those abnormal uh, delta wave correlate with the patient's symptom scores. So now we have a good MEG marker based on the MEG slow wave. We'll, we approach sensitivity 85% but positive binding rate, way better than the CTMR for MRTBI. And now we can look at the individual patient because you know, you know the MRTBI is pretty much you know uh, heterogeneous. You know, we can look at individual patients to see what part of their brain is affected uh, or damaged by MRTBI. And we can also uh, see what part of the brain, you know, as a group, more vulnerable to TBI, and uh, can look at you know, the correlation of the slow wave generation was the uh, post concussion symptoms. Now I want to look at you know something deeper. Uh, you heard about the delta wave, you know, and the or TBI, but you probably also heard about the slow wave or delta wave sleep. And so even a an, even a healthy subject like us, you and me, you know, I mean, now you fall asleep, and uh, and this uh, the, the molecular mechanism of this human uh, uh, circadian circadian rhythm, you know, is actually revealed by this uh, three guy how uh, uh, Ross Bash and Yang and they win Nobel Prize in twenty seventeen in medicine for the contribution of that and. Um, but when you look at you know these uh, sleep cycles, there's two things actually come to, to your mind. Look at the, uh, the non-REM stage three and four. So basically, when you start awake, when when you fall asleep, you go to the non-REM stage one, two, three, four. In in the three in stage three and four, you have the slow wave or delta wave generation, which was a pronounced signature if you record EEG during that sleep stage, and then it the, goes from the uh, deep sleep four and three, back to two, and then you start the REM, the rapid eye movement and uh, stage. That time you had a vivid dream and things like that, you know, and then you go back again, usually you have two cycles, you have a deep sleep, and it was not REM state, state three and four, and, and then go back to REM. The third cycle, you really didn't go to stage four, just then go to stage three, and then go shallower and shallower, and then you wake up, right? So this just each cycle lasts about, about ninety minutes, you know. So, uh, but the key is the delta wave sleep in the stage three and four. So for quite a while, we understand the sleep cycle, but the problems, what is brain doing? You know, doing the delta wave sleep, it's not quite clear until this uh, very important paper published by a group of scientists and uh, and. I want to talk about this this paper in more details, 
and first author Xie, you know, and in this case, you know, the the reveal actually during the the deep sleep, delta wave sleep, the brains actually do something very important. We call, they call it metabolic clearance. And once we talk about other papers, you know, and uh, how the sleep, you know, and the actual effect and the, um, you know, the, you know, and the, uh, can, can, lead, can, can actually uh, lead to the TBI, you know, and also we talk about another one, you know, this uh, sleep and, and their relationship with the beta amyloid. So let's focus on the Shears paper 20, in 2013. That's actually paper is very important because that's the first paper. They link, in my opinion, and electrophysiology during sleep with a metabolic clearance process happening in the brain. So the, the senior authors named a network, you know, and, uh, and so the paper published 2013, that received the award, the top 10 scientific paper in that year. The top of scientific paper, not only neuroscience, but also, you know, physics, chemistry, and, uh, and other area, you know. And certainly it's number one rank in neuroscience publication in 2013. So why that type of paper is important? And let me show you what the paper do. You know, it's animal research and uh, for the animal. And of course, you know, they can open the skull, put the electrical EEG, you know, and the uh, ECOG electrical grid uh, on the cortex. And the main tracer they're doing the research is uh, the CSF tracer, you know, how easy the CSF fluid, you know, to actually in the travel in the brain, you know. So when the animal is awake, the orange one, you can see, you know, the CSF actually confined very, very high space. But when the animal fall asleep, of course, one of the things that fall asleep, you go to deep sleep, you can see the delta wave, the green bar pop up, you know, and, uh, and doing that delta wave sleep, something magic happening, you know, the extracellular space open up like magic. And the, the CSF go from the orange to the gray, they go much deeper. And uh, you can see the drastic change uh, between awake and the deep sleep, delta wave sleep. Yeah, another major CS tracer in percentage. Actually, you can achieve the same effect uh, by applying ketamine zetazine and, and <laughs> anesthesia medication. Of course, they also generate huge delta wave sleep from the orange to the, to the brownish. Delta wave, sleep, delta wave goes up drastically. Again, when the animal is awake, you have this confined CSF space. When you apply ketamine zetazine, and it goes from orange to red, the external space opens up drastically. You have this effect. The question is, you know, what is brain doing and why they need to open up external space? Actually, this paper answers the question. The brain actually clean up the toxic byproduct, you know, and uh, when, when, the, when the animal during the daytime, for example, one of the toxic uh, protein is beta amyloid. So here's the curve in figure A shows, and when the animal is awake, the brain actually clean up the beta amyloid in the orange line. It's a little bit slower. When animal fall asleep, which is the brain or animal applied, you know, the animal zeolazine, which is uh, the brownish, the green and the brown actually overlay pretty much. You see much faster go back to baseline. So that means during the deep sleep, the other wave sleep or during the, the application of ketamine zealots in the brain, clean up the toxic beta amyloid drastically from the brain. We know beta amyloid is very toxic, associated with uh, a lot of you know cognitive uh, deficiency, uh, including the development uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So the brain uh, during the other wave sleep, they actually clean up you know those uh, uh, very toxic you know and, and substance from the brain. You know, there's another one, which is, uh, uh, I'm gonna pass this one, same effect, you know, and another toxic, uh, you know, and the substance actually not in the brain, where very quickly doing the either deep sleep with the other wave or apply for the ketamine zetas. Well, that's one thing the, the paper did. The question is, can you achieve something of the same effect when uh, animal are awake? The answer is yes, but you need to do some trick. When animal awake, 
Uh, but when they apply certain combination of medication, they're all in the category of this uh, and, and basic, you know, and the and the adrenergic uh, inhibitors. That's a whole list of that, you know. By applying this, you know, an adrenergic adrenergic inhibition, they achieve the same effect. You can see when apply this uh, this cocktail of uh, all in the class of you know adrenergic uh, inhibitor, uh, you can have a huge increase in delta wave, and also uh, open up the accelerator space from uh, uh, orange to purple. And again, for B, same thing, you know, drastic improvement. And the brain did something similar, you know, clean up those uh, abnormal and toxic uh, product, for example, you know, on the beta amyloid. So, yeah, we know, you know, the, uh, the delta wave potentially an indication of heating mechanism, you know, when, when the brain is damaged. And uh, so in the case of MAR-TBI, we, we, we believe the, the brain trying to do its job to repair the damage. Doing that process to generate a lot of uh, beta amyloid. This, this example shows actually, and the sleep or, or the met metabolic clearance actually very important for clean up those uh, beta amyloid is by um, Maraska. What they're doing is look at the three group animals, the control and um, was, you know, the control actually uh, either go to sham damage or go to TBI. And what they're looking at in this case, you know, the, um, the beta amyloid uh, precursor. So when animal receive no damage in, in the cortical level, you can see there's a minimum, you know, on the beta amyloid in the concentration. When the animal get damaged in the cortical level, you see a huge increase in this uh, beta amyloid. Same thing for the subcortical hippocampus, sham versus uh, TBI. For the TBI animal, you see a huge increase of the beta amyloid precursor. When they actually have a, the animal go to sleep induction, they induce the other way sleep. You can see, see you know, during the sham uh, injury, there's nothing happened, right? You know, and the, but when the animal was injury, but go to the, the deep sleep induction, you can see the brain clean up the beta amyloid drastically in the cortical level and also in the hippocampus. So the sleep induction treatment is very effective for you know, the, the animal with TBI. That's why I think people, a lot of patients with concussion, uh, they sleep longer, at least in the first you know, a few days, sometimes weeks, you know, because the brain had to do its job, healing damage, you know, remove the toxic byproduct, you know, which was beta amyloid. And the third one called sleep restriction. That, that name actually is, uh, Misleading. It's like a manipulation. In this case, um, the sham group didn't show anything, and uh, but the the TBI group, you know, instead of let the animal fall asleep, they actually touch the animal. Don't want them to fall asleep right away. And after a while, the animal is so tired. When they let let you know animal fall asleep, they go to the deep sleep uh, directly. So that manipulation also clean up the toxic. Uh, beta amyloid, most both in cortical level and the hippocampus. So there's a confirmation. And number one, the TBI will lead to you know an increase of the beta amyloid, which is the one of the byproduct when the brain try to do the requirements, you know. And, and the, those ones, those byproducts happen to be highly toxic to the brain. So either through through sleep induction treatment or the, the sleep manipulation treatment, you can actually let the brain remove those toxic beta amyloid precursor very easily and uh, help the brain to recover from TBI. Uh, another example is on human research. In this case, uh, we look at the MEG delta uh, slow wave and uh, uh, disruption versus the you know the uh, the brain's beta amyloid. So the so in, in this case. Look at the A. Uh, the the x axis is the delta wave power. The y axis is the beta amyloid. You see this correlation there. But notice the the, the scale of the x axis is negative twenty, negative forty, negative sixty. That's not typical. 
is when you go to the right, you become smaller and smaller. Usually when you go to the right, from left to right, right, you go to the, the scale get larger and larger. This one, the plot in the opposite direction. So, which means the more negative, which is the less the other way power, positive correlate with more and uh, with the amyloid concentration, okay? And the opposite also true, you know, we could go to the left, the less, no, the, um, the higher the delta wave power, say minus 20 is higher than minus 60, right? The higher the delta wave power, you know, the, the less with the amyloid concentration. So it's, it's counterintuitive. We, we call it the plot, you know, the, the scale in a um, non-traditional way, but the conclusion is pretty obvious. More delta wave power indicate just less and uh, uh, beta amyloid concentration it means the brain doing the job clean the toxic uh, beta amyloid, just like the, the animal research shows. So, and in summary, we have this, uh, you know, uh, the metabolic clearance mechanism associated with the slow regeneration and uh, doing the non REM delta wave sleep or uh, sleep by um, cadmium zeolazine and uh, or during a weak stage with the antigenergic inhibition. So we know that the other way generation is associated with metabolic clearance as a heating mechanism, you know. And uh, so that's the summary for this, the other way three. And now I'm gonna talk about another topic, which is the in high end, you know, the other way was very low frequency one, you know. And uh, so the, um, uh, now we can talk about you know high frequency thirty to eighty hertz, so called a gamma band activity, and that can, that happened to be another very good in you know, a marker for mild TBI, but due to different you know and uh, mechanism. So we know the brain have a lot of neurons, right? The neurons in general can be divided roughly into two type, depend on their function, and can be um, the excitatory, which is the is like a, like a primer shape, PR, a primary cell. And uh, they're the one that generate the MEG signal. But on top of that, you have this inhibitory plus spiking interneuron. And, uh, and the, the yellow one, they are usually scabergic and uh, their function is uh, inhibition. So the inhibitory interneuron actually uh, modulate the firing of the primary cell and the, the, the primitive cell, which generates the MEG signal. And the animal research shows the gamma energy interneuron are highly sensitive to MAR TBI. When you damage the, the gamma energy interneuron, and that's two consequences. The first one is the increase of the spontaneous firing. Basically, because of the, lack of, the lack of inhibition. If there's a little bit noise in the environment, the primary cells start to fire. And that could lead to a high frequency gamma band noise. We call it, you know, we can detect with MEG in the case of uh, MAR TBI. And uh, another consequence is, you know, if you challenge the system with some uh, patent stimuli to try to evoke some synchronized high frequency gamma, then the, uh, the subject or animal you know, with the gamma urgic neuron damage they tend to generate less synchronized gamma than the healthy controls. So those two go to opposite direction. Let me let me highlight those one in the next slide. And oh, the one after next. This is the same thing, you know, show actually uh, from the first lecture, I showed the MEG signal really come from the excitatory primitive cell, okay? So MEG is insensitive to the gamma urgent neuron directly. The reason is because these, the big cell, the primitive cell, that line up parallel, that allows signal summation, or the gamma urgent inhibitor neuron that look like spaghetti. The, 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 the signal summation is, you know, is not in, in a favorable condition. But when this gamma urgent neuron damaged, you know, we're gonna see there's a lack of you know, inhibition, either from the input end or from the output end, shows up over here. Uh, if that's the case, you know, I see the consequences of that. So here's a one, maybe the first um, histology research showing that, you know, these uh, inhibitory interneuron can be 
injured by multi-BI in animals. Here's the animal research from multi-BI. You can see those two inhibitor interneuron. Uh, when the neuron had no damage, the intact one, the four you know, uh, arrow indicate as like a hairline axon. Okay, they're hardly looking. You have to look very hard to see this, this ones. But when this neuron got damaged, you see this, you know, the second one below was arrow point over there. You can see the cell swollen. With different, uh, same technology, and uh, go all point to the same, you know, mechanism of the axonal injury and the, you know, GABAergic interneuron. But the other thing is very important. You can see the axonal injury is very close to the cell body, the soma, which is quite different from the Y matter. The Y matter is far further way down there, you know. Here, the injury actually is very close to the cell body, it's within gray matter. So when this one's damaged, that generate, you know, quite obvious functional deficit, depend upon your, your conditions. This example, you know, shows the functional consequences of the GABAergic interneuron damage into two group of animals. The black one in figure A is a parallel a spectrum, and uh, the black one is the animal with no damage. The red one, the red curve, is power spectrum with animal with GABAergic interneuron damage. And doing the like a spontaneous addressing state recording, uh, highlight in the uh, in the circle over here, at around forty hertz, you can see the animal with GABAergic interneuron damage. The red one can show a lot of spontaneous firing over the animal's no damage, which is the black one, okay. And then the same group, the challenged animal was a pattern stimuli, like a light, okay. And what they're looking at is the, the light evoked synchronized activity in D. Here, the pattern actually reversed. The, the animal was no damage that show actually a lot higher synchronized Activity, you know, say around 40 hertz, the gamma band activity. In contrast, the animal with gamma urgent neuron damage, the, the red one, show less synchronized gamma. So we can see the second circle over there below in F, the red one have less synchronized gamma than the black one, which, is, which means animal with injury of the gamma urgent in the neuron system show less synchronized gamma than the animal with no injury. So you see the pattern of two circles reversed. So depend upon your condition, either spontaneous recording or evoked synchronous gamma, you get the opposite effect, which is which is pretty good. So in the in the coming in the next study, and we're gonna look at the spontaneous recording, we expect to see and uh, the MarTBI patient with potential gamma urgent interneuron damage show the increased high frequency gamma noise. Yeah, uh, in this case we have a. Uh, 25 healthy control and 25 RTBI. There's a, this is symptoms you know on the table they have. You can see, you know, the TBI have a lot more symptoms than the healthy control, and which is the nature of this uh, this questionnaire. They have a lot of symptoms ongoing, and also we they also have some uh, issues with uh, new cognitive functioning and uh, deficit. We can measure by neuropsych uh, exams with the decaf. Uh, trail task, you know, decaf proper fluency task, and the with digit symbol coding task. They have this uh, poor performance in the TBI group comparison control. Here's our main findings. And with high frequency gamma band 30 to 80 hertz, and the group one, 25 um, RTBI versus uh, 35 um, uh, healthy controls. Anything shown in yellow means the TBI group have a higher or increased high frequency gamma activity compared with the healthy control. Exactly as we expected, you know, see there's a lot of area, the frontal pole area, the infrafrontal gyri, and the you know these uh, um, supplemental motor area and multiple regions in the parietal lobe, you know, including this superior uh, parietal lobe, you know the Supermarginal gyri, the angular gyri, the you know, parietal lobe, the OC shows a very pronounced high frequency gamma noise in TBI compared with control. And that's one region, which is the ventrolateral driven the cortex, showed the opposite and uh, showing blue, but vast majority is showing yellow. 
Uh, please ignore brainstorm because that's so deep and uh, um, you know, the reviewer don't believe you can see something deep, but we just present our result in honest in honest fashion and without making too much indication for that. But the the cortical level is there's no no doubt we see the pronounced you know and the high frequency increase in gamma band activity in MTBI comparison control. We also correlate those area was abnormal. The other way was uh, uh, in, in the, this case with even you know cognitive functioning. You see the area in the previous slide show frontal lobe, you know, in your frontal gyri show this increased gamma. They also show negative correlation. Any in blue means they have negative correlation with the cognitive functioning. It means more increase in those region with high frequency gamma noise, they have poor performance. And with the uh, cognitive functioning, with the negative correlation showing blue over here. So the summary of this uh, study shows actually there's a uh, in compact related uh, veterans with smart TBI that shows hyperactivity in the multiple frontal area and also parietal regions. And with one region, we showed hyperactivity in the ventral medial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex. We see the correlations between MEG hyperactivity and negatively correlate with the cognitive performance. Uh, okay, so what the open the door for a lot of uh, and uh, other you know, disorders, you know, and uh, for example, you know, and uh, we know a lot of uh, other disease might also suffer from uh, this uh, uh, damage to the GABA neuron, for example, epilepsy, uh, schizophrenia, and early Alzheimer's disease, the MCI population, all have this uh, gamma urgent engineer damage at the first stage of the injury. Now we have a, a powerful tool based on MEG non invasive surgery. Hopefully, we can apply this one to the different you know, brain disorders. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Um, I'll talk about another topic, you know, and uh, which is the uh, and the uh, uh, post traumatic stress disorder (PTSD). It's another interest uh, of our research because uh, the veterans population suffer more TBI, and also does suffer a lot the post traumatic stress disorder. We know that PTSD is a major issue for veterans and military. Uh, active duty pop population, and it also happened, you know, in the in natural disaster, for example, the earthquake the tsunami in Japan in 2011, a lot of uh, civilians suffer from PTSD. And in the past, through, you know, a positive animation topography pad or fMRI, we know in certain brain area, the form a circuitry called PTSD neurocircuitry, very important. The three regions are to stand out. The first one is the uh, amygdala, that have the hyperactivity. Second one is the uh, hippocampus, that also show the hyperactivity. One region showed the opposite effect is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, VMPFC, that tend to show opposite, show hypo activity. We know the VMPFC actually is very important in area, and that send down top-down modulation to suppress the fear activity from the amygdala and the hippocampus. When something damaged in the VMPFC, you have a less top-down modulation, just like you're driving a car, when, but the brake is not fully functioning. So you are, you know, you'll be in a pretty you know, under dangerous situation in that case. You know, here's the VMPFC just like a brake and uh, while the engine just like you know, the amygdala and the, the, the hippocampus. In the past, we also know those regions function through isolated cases. I mentioned this one in the early part of my first talk. And the famous case, you know, Phineas Gage, uh, when the accident happened, the, the bark penetrated his skull. He survived, but his ventral medial field, the cortex damage, totally changed his uh, personality. Before, he is such a nice gentleman. And, now he's very you know irritable, a little bit thing, he just lose control, become like an emotional monster. Now we know because the, the VMPFC is damaged with lack of top-down modulation. You know, also you know, talk about this uh, uh Henry Mollison, you know, and uh, 
he's you know he was actually you know a patient with uh but uh, bilateral hippocampal and epilepsy and in the in the 50s when he was quite young you know and so that time you know our pay, you know our knowledge about the function of the uh, hippocampi are quite limited so the neurosurgeon hey is a bilateral discharge hey let's cut them off both so the you can see the hole over there that's the mr and uh, uh, of him, he survived the surgery. Actually, lived a long life, and uh, but his hippocampus is cut off on both ends. I see the hole over here, you know. Uh, it, he, his IQ is about average, you know. After surgery, his long-term memory is pretty much you know preserved, but he's a huge memory deficit. He cannot encode new information from short-term memory to long-term memory. So what when you walk in, say hello to him, he can have a like a natural dialogue with you. Uh, but when you get out, get a cup of coffee, get back five minutes later, you have no memory the previous conversation even happened, you know. And because I have no way to, to encode short term long memory to long term memory. So very devastating. That was the first actually studied by a famous doctor, Brainerd Miller, also in the Montreal Neurological Institute, and a, a great doctor. and. Uh, Based on this single case, that's a, almost up to a thousand publications. You know, his brain when he died in his in his eighties, his brain was uh, you know and uh, was cut you know into slices in the a previous MEG center in the building in in the Sorrento Valley, and now we know his real names Henry Mollison. There's one actually very sad video clip you might still find on maybe YouTube. Uh, I first see that, you know, in Discovery Channel when he was in his 70s, you know, so quite old, you know. And uh, every day wake up, you know, I look at the mirror. It feel pretty sad. The reason is because in his memory, he's still 20 some years old, handsome young guy. But when he look at the mirror, he see, you know, a 70 plus years old, old man. And uh, so he cannot establish the association of the mirror image of himself with his long-term memory. In his brain, so pretty sad story, you know. But the, his contribution to human memory is phenomenal, you know. So because the, you know, and the patient was bilateral discharge, now they cannot cut both, you know, uh, uh, side of uh, hippocampus, because you know, because you know, yeah, you know, and also many many of the studies based on this case, and there's another guy, which is uh, not so good. The doctor, you know, I mentioned that, you know, and the, the the infamous, you know, Dr. Walter Freeman in his lobotomy, you know, in, in this case, you know, and the, and he you know, also last century, you know, and the, he had this hypothesis, all the frontal illness is due to, there's too much connection between thalamus and the frontal lobe and all the psychiatric disorders, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, PTSD, you name it. All everything is due to too many connections between thalamus and, and parental, prefrontal cortex. So somehow you can cut those fibers to heal all this mental illness. Okay, it's hypothesis. Well, he he's entitled to his hypothesis, but before doing any more any any more research or things like that, he applied this hypothesis directly operate on living human being. And uh, so and uh, so the result is is, is is terrible, you know. And uh, so was it. At the beginning, you know, he, you know, his lobotomy operation, you need to remove a piece of temporal bone and go deeper to cut those fibers. But those operations take many hours. They're so subject to infections and, and other you know, complications. But one, one day, a weekend, he drive his uh, family home, we have a picnic with his wife and children. I think some a suburb, I think Philadelphia, I believe. And uh, that time, refrigerator is not very common. And uh, he, he buy a gigantic piece of uh, ice from the supermarket, put it on me. Before this picnic, he, he used his icebreaker to break the ice in small pieces. That moment, a spark come to his brain. Wow, that's, that could be my high-end you know, surgical tool for lobotomy. That's what he did. They take this uh, the chisel, pointy chisel, point to the, the skull behind the eye socket. We know the, the, the eye, you know, behind the eye socket, the, 
the skulls very, very thin, and they use the hammer to the the, the the hit that you know that you know and the, the chisel inside and violent turned off the tools to cut those fibers. Very, very, you know, violent. And if the patient survived you know, this operation, at the beginning, his the chisel is point level, you know, likely point to the, you know, and the, you know, to the amygdala. So after his uh, the early stage of the patient, if they survive, they, they lose their emotion. They become numb, I think. You know, they're not afraid of anything, but they also don't show any sign of love, emotion. And then he tried to improve, quote unquote, improve his operation by pulling his chisel upward. And the result is even worse. You know, many have late stage of his operation, the patient, you know, symptom getting more severe. Now we know because when it point upward, it probably target the, the ventral medial PFC, you know, damage that part. That means the last further, you know, top-down modulation. That means the symptom getting worse. He operated on thousands of patients. And the beginning from the East Coast, now and later on, he cannot operate East Coast, move to West Coast in you know, California, Southern California in particular, you know. Well, you know, a thousand patients, sometimes the patient died in the, operator, in the operation table, they just move on. You know, so he made a top 10 list of the 10 worst doctor in history. You know, and uh, in the same list with, with uh, Shio Ishii, you know him, he's the medical doctor of, you know, the, during World War II, the Japanese, you know, and the military doctor. And they, they operate, you know, and they also inject, you know, the living virus and bacteria in, 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 the, in the Chinese citizens in Northeast China. And also, uh, well, the number one on the list is Joseph uh, Minkler. Joseph Minkler, is that have nickname called, uh, you know, on the, the angel of death. He's a, such a handsome German medical doctor. He, he's so evil. They sent potentially him and his colleagues sent millions of Jewish people into this, uh, you know, uh, you know, poison gas chamber. And so, uh, being the same list is not a good thing. Well, you know, now we we can actually uh, look at you know this uh, the function of the PTSD neurocircuitry. See if we can do better, you know. And in this case, we use uh, MEG, and we we try to see whether we can actually and uh, get something actually and uh, similar to the fMRI and PET findings. So what we have is a residency recording where twenty five uh, veterans, active duty military personnel with PTSD, of uh, thirty healthy controls. The hypothesis: We're going to see this hyperactivity. In Amygdala and hippocampus, we see the hypoactivity in the PFC. This process, I've skipped up that part. We look at the frequency band. Here's the beta band activity from 15 to 30 hertz. Anything showing in yellow with this area have hyperactivity, showing blue the hypoactivity. Yeah, and this PTSD um, compared with healthy control. We well, can see the, the two white arrow in the upper. Uh, left corner and point to hyperactivity from the bilateral uh, amygdala and the left and the hippocampus over here, uh, which is pre measure prediction from this uh, fMRI and PET research. We also see there's a blue, which is the, the green arrow point. That's the VIPFC, hypoactivity, exactly as our uh, prediction lead us to. But we also see a lot of new things. For example, right, we also see this uh, bilateral hyperactivity from this uh, orbital frontal cortex. A lot of blue area in other prefrontal area, like also lateral prefrontal cortex, the ventral lateral uh, frontal cortex, uh, some regions in the precuneus and parietal region. So we see a lot of new uh, uh, functional information there. For the high frequency gamma and the high gamma, similar. We still see in the high gamma band this amygdala and hippocampus hyperactivity. Uh, we also see the VMPFC, the, the green arrow. You know, that's something we expected uh, in beta and high gamma band. Uh, but the low frequency one, for example, you know, an alpha and low frequency one, we don't see that much hyperactivity. Well, a tiny bit in this uh, uh, 
in the posterior region, but the, the dominant activity is the decrease of alpha and low frequency one in the prefrontal areas and also in uh, precuneous cortex, you know, on the parietal lobe. We also see there's correlations between this uh, uh, positive correlation between the MEG activity and the amygdala, positive correlate with the symptom scores, positive correlation with the orbital frontal cortex, a negative correlation, and reduction of the PFC correlate with more symptoms in ventral medial fibular cortex, and so on and so forth. So, on the, and I also want to show you actually there's a nice correlation and consistency between our finding and the uh, another findings from a functional MR. This is fMRI findings from Yan and the laboratory. They're using residency fMRI, uh, also PTSC comparison control. They also show as a bilateral increase in the hippocampus and also amygdala area, and also the orbital frontal cortex, just like ours. And also see, you know, this uh, prefrontal cortex, you know, and the, the DRPFC, and also the precuneus, pretty much the same, the same thing as our findings. But there's one area is missing, which is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which is one of the major area that we show as hypo activity is missing from this study. So, and uh, so this uh, as a strong indication that the, uh, we have a, a MEG finding similar to fMRI, but the, in this particular case, actually our, our finding potentially is more sensitive than theirs. Um, I'm gonna stop over here. There's a lot of topics, you know, and I can cover, but you know, and because there are the time limit, I cannot, you know, and uh, cover those ones, you know, and uh, but if you like, you know, we can, you know, on the meeting we can explore and given, you know, and the strategies. For example, we have a lot of information. We can actually look at these uh, uh, machine learning to give us, you know, a good classification for, you know, and the uh, MTBI versus, uh, uh, and we can also look at the other, you know, and the topics, for example, you know, machine learning, well, this one actually is the hippocampus volume measurements. We can also look at the, you know, the diffusion tensor imaging. We can also look at uh, the children's research on TBI and uh, a lot of topics, you know, I. I I don't have time to skip over because time limit. And also this uh, paper actually published uh, from our students, you know, and his graduate getting his PhD from Troy, Troy Bu, and uh, yeah, using deep learning and try to decode and uh, a slight accuracy in the hand gesture, rock, paper, and scissors, you know, and uh, this had not been done in the past. The first functional imaging was able to decode and single trial basis, you know, high accuracy, and you know the hand gesture based on almost the same muscle group, you know. And in the past, people can use EEG, you know, to uh, deep learning to differentiate the left hand versus the right hand. And uh, but for the same hand, same muscle group, just subtle group different, subtle, subtle difference, hand gesture, lock, lock, paper, and scissors. In the past, you know. Had, had been have ch quite challenged for other modality, but we are able to do that in a single trial basis with pretty high accuracy. And thanks Troy for the excellent work. And uh, you can see the accuracy, you know, overall is approaching 85, 86%. Some of, some subject is about 90%. So yeah, the lot of topics, you know, I cannot cover today, but uh, uh, if you have interest, and that's neat. And, uh, and also more important, and uh, less, you know, meet if I have interest using our MEG for your, for helping your research. So I mentioned multiple times we're open for for business. If you want, want to use MEG, we help you understand the brain function, and uh, we are in the middle set up meeting with multiple PIs. You know, and uh, so please, you know, and uh, send me an email, and uh, we can go through your topic and something of your interest. We can help you design or improve your design, make your experiment feasible for MEG. We can help you on this, 
on setting up the, the pipeline for data analysis, data acquisition. And uh, so, um, yeah, I think we have the brand new imaging machine, as I mentioned that in the early on of this, uh, this lecture.